All right, let's get started. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. My name is Chama Collison, and I am the VP of Solutions Architect uh, at Mission. We are an AWS advanced consulting partner uh, with offices in Los Angeles and uh, Boston. And I'm joined today by Kirill Dubrovsky, who is the principal solutions architect uh, on our team. Um, our goal today is to talk about strategic technology road mapping and using roadmaps to help you align technology development with your business. Uh, shameless plug here at the outset, this is part of what Mission does, and if you'd like to talk with us about your particular strategic technology issues, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Just type yes into the questions box at any point during uh, this presentation, just the word yes, and somebody from Mission will follow up with you um, to set up a time to talk more. Uh, as we go through the presentation, please feel free to chime in with questions as we go. That's what that questions box is there for. Uh, Kirill is here uh, monitoring those questions um, and uh, will happily uh, provide some answers along, along the way. So a quick outline of today's session is here. Uh, we'll start off with why road mapping is an important use of your time, uh, talk some about what goes into a good strategic roadmap, and give you some tips about ways you can do some effective road mapping for your business or organization, and we'll have some time uh, for questions at the end, but as I said, feel free also to pop questions into the question box as we go along. So let's start with that uh, most basic question. Why spend time road mapping when you have a long list of things to do? Uh, and you know, from my point of view, the answer to that question is really embedded in the question itself. It's precisely because you have a long list of things to do that it's really important to, to invest the time uh, in road mapping. And so before we move on, I want to remind you of a simple truth that, you know, frankly, I think gets uh, overlooked far too often in business. And that's the time is one of your most precious commodities. And there are opportunity costs to literally everything you do. And if you're at all like me, you have way more things on your to-do list than you have time available to accomplish those things. And so when you're faced with such a situation, you have a few choices uh, how to proceed. You can either uh, just choose things randomly, not spend any time you know, trying to make choices. You just spend all your time doing. Or you can go for coverage and do the best possible job on the most possible number of tasks. But um, if you're all at all like me, again, um, if we're being honest, that probably means doing a little bit of a poorish job on just about everything you touch. Or obviously the best choice here, you can be strategic about what you work on, when, and how much needs to get done before you move on to the, to the next thing. Now, I'd like to show you two ways that we often see this issue of uh, you know, too many things on the to-do list and not enough time to get them done. Um, two ways that we see that show up in our work with some of our customers. Uh, and the first one is, is this. When we start working with a new customer, one of the things that we often ask them is to identify their top organizational objectives. Um, and what you see here is a, is a pretty typical answer. Those aren't the, the choices uh, in the question, those are actually the, the answers. And if you count it up, you'll see that there are, this customer identified um, 12 things. And when I see an answer like this, I'm reminded of two things. The first is that scene in uh, the first Incredibles movie when Mrs. Incredible is uh, getting on Dash's case uh, telling him to chill out a little bit and not use his, his superpowers at, at school and try to fit in a little bit more. And Dash says to his mom that his dad had told him that uh, superpowers are nothing to be ashamed of, that in fact they are what make them special. And Mrs. Incredible says to Dash in a you know really mom-like voice that uh, everyone is special. And Dash rolls his eyes, turns away, and says, that's like saying no one is. Uh, so in, in other words, if you have uh, 12 top priorities, then you're really at risk of having no top priorities because you're not effectively differentiating. 
With 12 top priorities, to some extent, everyone is special, so maybe no one is. And the problem with 12 top priorities is that uh, you're really in, in uh, boil the ocean territory. Now, I get why some of our customers provide answers like this, and I'm actually really glad that they do, because they've identified 12 things that they want to work, uh, that they want to work on. 12 ways that they can improve the way technology is working for them. But in most cases, working on 12 top priorities just isn't realistic. And so one of the things that, uh, that I want to suggest that you keep in mind is that your top priorities need to be practical and achievable, not only individually, but also collectively. Now, the other way that we see this problem show up uh, sometimes with customers is when they share their project boards with us. Uh, and often these project boards have lots of projects on them, sometimes 20, 30, or even 40 different things on them, typically with some prioritization shown for uh, each item on the list. And that prioritization is, is great because it shows that the customer isn't choosing what they spend, uh, choosing what they spend their time on just randomly. Um, but they're probably taking that second approach, going for coverage rather than really making tough choices and really being strategic. One indication of this, one way to tell whether they're being strategic or, or making really, um, uh, or just going for coverage, is to look at the distribution of, uh, of their priorities. And if it looks like this graph here with lots of high priorities and relatively few medium and low priorities, rather than uh, the inverse with relatively few high priorities but more medium and low priorities, chances are that they're going for, for coverage rather than really being strategic. Now, it's a really important point that the graph on the left isn't wrong if it's true. If in fact you have lots of things that feel like really high priorities, that's a really important starting point. That's a really important state of affairs to validate and, and work off of. But the key is that that should be your starting point for strategic planning and not actually your, your strategic plan. As you go through the planning process, your goal is to go from that graph on the left where you have lots of competing high priorities to the graph on the right where you have fewer high priorities. The key though, is to do that in a way that actually still addresses your business needs. It doesn't do you any good to just arbitrarily throw some things overboard and say, these things aren't high priorities, I'm gonna make them medium or low priorities, um, if in fact they really are high priorities because that's just ignoring the issue. When that happens, you'll see this other issue that we sometimes see. It's not about the distribution of priorities, it's about inflation of priorities, where the high priorities start to get overridden by things like critical or urgent or super critical or override. It's like the large drink becoming the big gulp, the super big gulp and the double big gulp. You keep getting bigger and bigger. And that kind of priority inflation generally indicates a strategy level issue. Either you're not being sufficiently strategic or discriminating in how, you're, in how you identify your top priorities, or you're ignoring certain issues, or you're getting stuck in, in break fix. In any case, that's an underlying issue that needs to be fixed uh, as you set and plan out your priorities. So to summarize all of that, the reason to invest some of your precious time in road mapping is that it is the most effective way, at least that we know of, to maximize the impact of your efforts. So that brings us to the question of what a good roadmap looks like. And in my view, a good roadmap accomplishes three things. It sets real priorities, it comprehensively acknowledges the real issues, it doesn't just ignore some things, and it establishes a target or a direction. Now we've talked about some of these things um, individually and we'll, we'll continue to do so as we go through the rest of this session. But one of the things that uh, I wanna emphasize is that these three different areas are really all intertwined and separating them artificially can be problematic. 
In fact, dealing with the interconnectedness of these three different issues is really the key to developing an effective roadmap that just won't sit on the shelf, but will actually drive action and will help you align your technology uh, with your business. And so I'm gonna ask you for a moment to consider two ideas that may seem inherently contradictory. The first is that you need to make decisions about what you're not going to worry about or work on. Said another way, you need to decide what is not included in your top priorities. That's gonna help you get that top priority bar a little bit shorter. But at the same time, you need to not ignore any of the things that are on your issues list because ignoring issues is how problems fester and when things fester, you start to run into priority inflation, which derails your planning. So <clears throat> the key for that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the key for that is to uh, uh, begin to by setting the true top priorities. And I'll show you two uh, exercises to help you, uh, help you make headway on balancing those two competing priorities. The first I said is to flush out those things that are legitimate top priorities. And for most companies, those are things that are either uh, about leaking money, causing a significant and undue operational burden, or negatively affecting your customers or partners. Now, the other area that you might be uh, tempted to include here uh, are things that restrain your growth. And growth is obviously critically important and is definitely worth considering here. But I wanna encourage you to approach this with a little bit of, bit of caution. Because if you're bleeding money, wasting resources, or hurting your customers, and you elevate a growth-oriented initiative as a higher priority to those foundational uh, initiatives, you either need to address those, uh, those three core problems uh, you know, as a top priority, or at least have a longer term solution on your roadmap that'll fix the root cause of these issues before the costs become too high. Otherwise, you can end up derailing that growth initiative as those as the costs in those three foundational is, issues begin to cum accumulate to the point where they simply become untenable for your organization. So growth initiatives are great to consider. You should definitely have them in mind but my strong advice is that you make sure that uh, these three areas about wasting time, wasting money, and hurting customers are addressed before you move on. Now, as you think about addressing these top priorities, especially things that are causing some pain, I wanna suggest that you think seriously about Band-Aids because Band-Aids work great, but only if you use them wisely, or to say it another way, strategically. We're really big fans of root cause analysis and fixing root causes so you're not stuck in that break fix cycle, but you don't always have time to do root cause analysis or root cause analysis or to fix those root causes. And sometimes you just need to lessen the pain as a way of buying time so you can work on other things or be more deliberate in fixing root causes. So a great approach is to com is to go is to combine, sorry, a short-term Band-Aid kind of fix with a longer-term uh, root cause kind of fix. And this two-phased approach is one that we often take with customers who come to us um, worrying that they're wasting money on their infrastructure. So we'll begin by cleaning up their spend for them. We'll look for places where they're, they've over-provisioned some resources or have some old dev instances running unnecessarily and so on. Uh, but that, that'll lower their costs right now but it does very little or nothing to address the root cause of their inefficient spend and their poor return on cloud spend. So we'll plan to address those more fundamental issues later in the plan, prioritized appropriately in comparison to the other things that we wanna do. The key though, is to address that critical issue, in this case, spending too much money, wasting money, at the good enough level so that we can turn down the urgency, buy some time, and focus on the bigger issues. Another really effective approach to um, setting some priorities is to spend some time uh, benchmarking. And AWS has developed a fantastic tool to help with this. It's called the Well-Architected Framework, uh, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, 
The well-architected framework is organized around these five pillars, operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. And it provides some be best practices uh, organized around these five pillars. Now, there are lots of resources on well-architected uh, available on the internet. I'm not gonna spend uh, much time going through that in detail here. Uh, we did a series of webinars on well-architected and there's some blogs as well that you can find on our website at missioncloud.com. Uh, AWS also has some really helpful resources uh, on well-architected, including something called a well-architected tool, uh, which you can actually use to uh, self-assess your environment against the well-architected framework. Um, now, well-architected is going to do at least two things for you. Even if you're taking the self-assessing approach, well-architected is going to give you some, in, some outside insight into how well-architected your environment is and the severity of any issues that uh, you identify. So it's gonna help you to set some priorities and it'll help you to identify some areas for improvement. It is, however, important to note that there's a limit to the benefit of this benchmarking because benchmarking as a general rule does a pretty poor job of considering what you're trying to accomplish. It's just not designed for that. So as an example, if I asked you to tell me which of these two vehicles is better designed, you might be tempted right out, uh, right out of the gate to say it's the Ferrari. It's clearly more expensive, it's more powerful. Most of us would say it's more stylish, it's faster, it's more a lot of things. But if what you need is a vehicle to haul lumber and dirt and sheetrock, then the Ferrari is obviously a terrible choice. Now, that's obviously an exaggeration uh, of a point, um, but benchmarking against best practices is really more effective at telling you which of these is in better shape than which of these is a better fit for your needs. So it's really useful, but it's not gonna tell you everything that you need to know. Now, the other benefit of uh, benchmarking, in particular using the, the well-architected framework, is that it will help you decompose larger tasks into smaller ones so that you don't have to choose between, say, working on security over cost optimization or performance efficiency over reliability. Instead, well-architected is gonna help you to identify some more specific tasks within each of these pillars so that you can then prioritize them more strategically with more granularity so that you can work on improving your stance in multiple pillars simultaneously. Now, working in parallel like that is a really important way to stave off priority inflation and to stay strategic. Now, as a final thought before we uh, open it up for any questions, I do think it's really important to note that we've been talking mostly in terms of prioritizing things that need to be fixed or things that are broken. Now, that's a really important starting point, and many organizations come to us feeling some pain around something specific that's not working well for them. So it makes sense to start with things that are, that are broken or that need to be fixed. But good strategic planning looks at that as only part of the equation. And it's the other part of the equation that actually most interests me and is why I really enjoy my job and being part of mission. At mission, we view our mission as helping you to achieve yours, which is why it's right there in our logo. But we're not gonna do that very effectively and you're not either working on your own. If the entire purview of your strategic technology roadmap is about fixing things that are broken. On the SA team where Kirill and I work, we view our job as helping the customers we work with transform their IT infrastructure into a strategic asset that helps drive the success of their company. That is much harder work though for a few reasons. The first reason is that it requires vision, but I'd be willing to bet that all of you here have plenty of vision and then if we asked you a few probing questions or maybe we sat down together for a coffee or a beer, talked for a little while, we could get some pretty great big ideas on the table pretty quickly. Some things that fall into the wouldn't it be great if category. And if you're looking to transform your IT into a strategic asset, then you really need to spend some time 
thinking about the wouldn't it be great if kind of questions for your business. But that's only part of the question and the more com common stumbling block, I think, is not knowing where to begin or what's possible or how to design or execute a project. And that's understandable given the dizzying array of tools and services that are available in AWS. It's a heck of a lot to keep track of, let alone figure out what's relevant for your business, how to leverage these tools, how to set priorities, or how to implement a project. Given this complexity, it's pretty easy to see how organizations begin to fall behind and accumulate tech debt. But the key is don't let that complexity get in the way or stop you in your tracks. And I'll finish up by get, sharing two images that maybe will help you uh, stay focused on this and make some progress. The first is to reinforce the idea of setting a direction. You don't have to know every step of the way or exactly what the destination looks like, but it is important to decide, for instance, that improving speed and efficiency is really important to you and your business, so you wanna get going with containers. Setting that as a direction is the key first step. The second step, the second important idea is the concept of the front domino. That's something that we believe really strong in, really, really strongly in, the power of finding and knocking down that front domino because one domino leads to the next domino and so on. So instead of worrying about having all the answers for how to containerize, define a containers a POC project as a front domino and then see what you learn. It's the start of the journey. Setting a direction and, a, and identifying that front domino gets you started, and that's really powerful. So I'll close with this, this reminder. The good strategic planning considers three discrete areas. What's hurting the business? What are the root causes of those issues? And what can you do to transform the business? Use those three questions to build your issues list and then to build your actual plan. Remember to decompose your initiatives into smaller chunks, set discriminating priorities, and consider using outside help, which is something that we haven't talked a lot about, and I'm obviously biased about that because that's what mission is all about. But there are some real benefits to uh, bringing in outsiders for this. One of those is that outsiders, by definition, bring a fresh set of eyes, and sometimes just getting a fresh set of eyes on a problem can really uh, help be transformative. We can see things that you can't see or that you no longer see simply because you're so close to the priority, uh, so close to the problem. Uh, the other thing that outsiders can do is help to give you organizational confidence to push certain things down the priority list. Getting a second opinion on deprioritizing something that feels like it's maybe really important can be really helpful. And then the third thing that outsiders can do is that they can help in all three, <clears throat> in all three of these areas that we talked about before. Quick identification and application of Band-Aids, the confident, uh, confidence in your root cause analysis and developing a plan for uh, fixing those root causes, and maybe most importantly, in the upside, that last bucket that we talked about. We don't have all the answers to everything, but we are experts in AWS and, and cloud technologies. It's our full-time job to stay on top of this stuff, and you're experts in your business. You know what could help transform your business, and we know how that can, that can get done, or if it can, can get done, and we can help you figure out how to get there. Those two uh, different sources of expertise are a really powerful combination. So that's the quick rundown. Uh, here's the, the uh, resources that I mentioned earlier um, uh, for uh, Well Architected uh, and for other information on, on mission. And uh, we'll hang out for a while to uh, answer any questions that you have, continue to uh, add them in the questions box. And as I said at the beginning, if you're interested in talking with a mission solutions architect about your specific strategic issues or the things that maybe need some band-aids uh, in your environment, you're struggling with priority inflation uh, or poor distribution of priorities, 
We'd love to talk with you. All you have to do is type yes, just the word yes in the uh, in the questions, and then somebody from Mission will follow up with you to set a time uh, on our calendars to get together. So uh, thanks very much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of the day. And as I said, we'll uh, happily hang out for a while and answer any questions you have. Thanks very much. Also, one final note: there is a um, there's a PDF in the uh, handout section that you can download. Uh, it uh, describes the mission's essay on demand uh, program. It's a free one-hour consultation with uh, somebody from the Solutions Architect team to talk about whatever is on your mind. It's a great program. Uh, down, download it, take a look, uh, and you can sign up for a session uh, on our website. All right, looks like we don't have any any questions, so uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thanks again, uh, everybody, for uh, for joining us today, and have a great rest of the day. And uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to help you out as you're working through your strategic roadmap. Thanks very much. Take care.